This is a presentation to the Community Services, Public Safety and Housing and Development City Council Subcommittee on March 22nd, 2022. My name is Jason Benitez. I am the Chief of the Oxnard Police Department. Tonight's topic is Assembly Bill 481. I will pre be providing a report on the funding, acquisition, and use of military equipment requirements for law enforcement agencies. The recommendation before the committee uh, today is that the Community Services, Public Safety and Housing and Development City Council Subcommittee receive a report concerning Assembly Bill 481, which regulates law enforcement agency funding, acquisition, and use of military equipment, and recommend that the City Council consider said report and conduct a public hearing on April 19, 2022, concerning an ordinance adopting a military equipment use policy. In this presentation, I will address the purpose of the new legislation, the definitions of military equipment, the Oxnard Police Department's military equipment inventory, Oxnard Police Department's proposed equipment funding, acquisition and use policy, the pending annual rec report requirement that comes along with this, and the community engagement requirement and public access to materials related to this topic. I believe that this is a very important uh, topic for our elected officials within our governing body, as well as our members of the members of our public to uh, fully understand uh, the nature of this legislation and how it impacts public safety. So, in order to see where we are today, we need to take a look back. And in looking at this, over the course of the past several years, criticism and debate has spread across the nation concerning the perception of policing in America becoming militarized. A key part of this discussion centers around the use of military equipment by law enforcement agencies, referred to in this presentation at times as LEAs, including the regulation and accountability for agencies that use such equipment. This includes the funding, the acquisition, and the use of this equipment by LEAs. Over the past several decades, many law enforcement agencies across the United States acquired a variety of military surplus equipment from the federal government and incorporated their use into their operations. The federal program that currently hosts this is the Defense Logistics Agency's 1033 program. Other forms of this program included the former Defense Reutilization Marketing Office. It's referred to as DERMO. Generally speaking, the equipment furnished to LEAs was intended to be necessary or beneficial to operations, intended to improve the safety of officers as well as the public, and help agencies acquire such equipment, especially in the face of limited budgets. The materials provided by these programs were very diverse and included items ranging from office furniture and equipment to gas masks, to rifles, to binoculars, to vehicles. These, these programs also furnished civilian type vehicles as well as the military purpose ones known as the Humvees. In this slide, you can see a picture of a Humvee in the lower right at some point in the past two decades, larger 12 or more ton mine resistant ambush protected armored vehicles known as MRAPs were also furnished to a number of law enforcement agencies across the country. In previous years, the Oxnard Police Department accepted a, a limited variety of items, including M17 gas masks, like the type you see in this slide, older generation rifles, typically post uh, Vietnam era rifles and rifle optics. These items have since been eliminated from the department's inventory. And for the record, the Oxnard Police Department has never requested nor received Humvees or the MRAP style armor vehicles. It is also important for me to emphasize that the Oxnard Police Department no longer obtains equipment from either of these programs. A little bit about 481. On September 30th, 2021, Governor Gavin Newsom signed legislation aimed at reforming law enforcement agencies' funding, acquisition, and use of specific types of 
quote unquote, military equipment. This legislation referred to as Assembly Bill 481 or AB 481 was authored by Assembly Member David Chu to address and regulate the funding, acquisition and use of military equipment by LEAs. For the purpose of this legislation, LEAs include any of the following, police departments, sheriff's departments, district attorney office, and county probation departments. Of note, AB 481 does not apply to federal LEAs. Now, effective on January 1st of this year, AB 481 is codified in government code sections 7070 through 7075. AB 481 obliges LEAs to obtain approval from their applicable governing body by adoption of a military use policy by ordinance prior to the law enforcement agency's ability to fund, acquire, or use such equipment. For simplicity, I will refer to the terms the policy and the ordinance in this presentation at times. LEAs must begin the process to have their governing body, in this case, the Oxnard City Council, uh, start the process for this no later than May 1st, 2022. This means a few things. The police department must develop a department policy that governs its use of military equipment. This policy must also include an inventory of those items or material that is deemed by AB 41 as being quote unquote military equipment. As it stands at the time of this report, the policy can be found in the Oxnard Police Department's policy manual, section 708. This policy is required to be posted on a department's website. In this case, it is currently posted as of March 3rd on the Oxnard Police Department's website. Uh, you see the uh, hyperlink there to oxnardpd.org. On the main page, under the main menu, there is a tab, Transparency, and under that you will find AB 481. Another important note is that any future acquisitions of any item deemed by AB 481 to be quote unquote military equipment will require a further public meeting, policy update, and a council approval. Law enforcement agencies must produce and submit an annual report to their governing body. In this case, it would the first report coming from us would be anticipated in the spring of 2023. Each year, the governing body will receive that report. They will review the ordinance. They will review the policy, and then they will either approve or disapprove a renewal of the authorization for a type of military equipment or modify the military equipment use policy. Prior to submitting the annual report to the city council, the police department must also hold at least one community engagement meeting within 30 days of submitting the annual military equipment report to the council. So let's start off by looking at what the definitions of military equipment is. AB 481's definition of military equipment extends beyond equipment that has a clear default to military use. This is currently codified in Government Code Section 7070C, subsections 1 through 15. And under this, the term more broadly applies to 15 categories of equipment types. For intents and purposes, of AB 481, this broad descriptor or categories of equipment type includes some equipment which is not typically used by the US Armed Forces. Other items deemed to be military equipment per AB 481 include equipment such as rifles and unmanned aerial systems, also known as drones, that are also available to the public by retail sale. In this presentation, I will provide you with an overview of each of these 15 categories as it is very important for the public to hear and know as much as possible about this equipment and how they are of great importance to the safety of others as well as the public that we serve. The first category, unmanned, remotely piloted, powered aerial or ground vehicles. <clears throat> 
in this picture you see on the left, this is the Oxnard Police Department's uh, drone. Uh, you can see our two operators from the department, and this is the type of drone that we, we use in our operations. The Oxnard Police Department has been deploying unmanned aerial systems, also known as UAS, since 2019. As you may recall, uh, I've done a number of presentations in a, a variety of public forums to uh, discuss our intended uses and restrictions and policies uh, that apply to this. On the subject of UAS, it's, they are easily deployed and they can have uh, a wide variety of utility for us as they can perform many functions that a helicopter would serve and can do so at a fraction of the cost. UAS have demonstrated their value to public safety and have become increasingly more necessary as they can provide visibility and overwatch at high risk locations or incidents. <clears throat> they can assist officers in perimeter searches. They can increase the possibility that an outstanding suspect can be safely located. UAS are also designed to enter small spaces such as enclosed structures, as well as to provide overhead observations of wooded areas and other structures located in often crowded spaces. They are also useful in documenting crime scenes and traffic collision scenes, significantly reducing the amount of time needed to accomplish this. All of the Oxnard Police Department's UAS personnel receive initial and ongoing training to operate this equipment. They must pass a certification course and must earn a certificate from the Federal Aviation Administration. All UAS flights are documented with flight logs, and the police department's policy expressly forbids arming or weaponizing such equipment. The police department has not received a single complaint about its use of UAS since their first deployment in 2019. In short, there are no reasonable alternatives that can perform the functions served by this equipment. And without the use of UAS, officers would have to more frequently place themselves into high-risk situations, which would naturally increase the risk to officers and members of the public. And looking at the photograph to the right, you see a, a ground vehicle. It's remote, remotely piloted or remote control um, ground vehicle. Unmanned ground vehicles are used for reconnaissance during critical incidents to assist in providing visibility in areas where it would be unsafe to send a person. This equipment enhances the capability of SWAT and tactical response teams by allowing them to quickly and safely inspect dangerous situations and eliminate the need to send personnel in before assessing the situation. Such systems can also be used to examine, move, or even diffuse potentially hazardous items. There is no alternative to this type of system for these purposes. Not having access to this item would require the use of peace officers to engage in higher risk tasks. On slide 10, we have mine resistant ambush protected vehicles known as MRAPs or armored personnel carriers. However, police versions of standard consumer vehicles are specifically excluded from this subdivision. And for the record, the Oxnard Police Department does have um, armored vehicles. However, they will be discussed in the next category. Um, what you see here at the lower right is a, an, actually an MRAP vehicle. It's a 12 plus ton vehicle. Um, our department does not have uh, such a type of vehicle. Um, nor has ever had one. Um, so just wanted you to see that picture to see what an MRAP actually looks like. In the next category, we have, which defines military equipment as high mobility, multi-purpose wheeled vehicles, also known as the commonly referred to as Humvees, two and one half ton trucks, five ton trucks, or wheeled vehicles that have a breaching or entry apparatus attached. The Oxnard Police Department currently possesses two such armored rescue vehicles as seen in these photos. One was acquired by purchase in 2006, and the one on the right was acquired by a donation in 2021. Armored vehicles are used to provide ballistic protection to officers and citizens during rescue, critical incidents, and other hazardous situations. The armored rescued vehicles used by the Oxnard Police Department are both from the Lenco Bearcat series and are built on a commercial vehicle chassis and are primarily reinforced civilian commercial vehicles. These are not tanks. These vehicles allow officers closer access to high-risk situations while 
substantially reducing the physical risk to the officers and the members of the public. They are generally deployed on SWAT operations, such as the service of high-risk warrants or to incidents requiring a tactical response. They are intended to serve as a rescue vehicle in the unfortunate event of a downed officer or person in immediate dire need of rescue. Though such equipment has the ability to serve as a breaching tool, as you can see on the right, there is a breaching mechanism on the front bumper of the uh, ARV. They are, um, there are no weapons that are affixed to either of these platforms. There are no reasonable alternatives that can achieve the same objectives of officer and civilian safety. As such, there are no alternatives to providing the same level of ballistic protection. I'd like to show the council as well as the public an example of one of our ARVs in action. <clears throat> in this photo you see it was taken in March of 2016. Um, there had been um, a suspect had fired a, a handgun at one of our officers who returned fire. Nobody was hit. Um, the suspect with the gun ran into this apartment complex that you see here into a random apartment, <clears throat> taking a family by surprise who, in uh, very concerned for their safety, they retreated to an upstairs bedroom and locked the door. Um, during this tactical operation, one of our first needs was to evacuate the family from the residence safely. And so the ARV was a, as a, an outstanding tool to accomplish this. As you can see in this picture, which was taken by the uh, Ventura County Sheriff's helicopter, one of the children from the house is being evacuated um, from the second story window to the roof of the ARV. Um, they are then put in the top hatch. And then once all the family members were secure, they were driven off to safety. This incident um, took a few more hours past this time and fortunately was concluded peacefully and the suspect uh, did surrender without any further use of force. On slide 13, we are talking about tracked armored vehicles that provide ballistic protection to their occupants and utilize a track system instead of wheels for forward motion. Uh, the Oxnard Police Department simply does not have any equipment from this category. Slide 14 talks about command and control vehicles that are either built to or modified to facilitate the operational control and direction of public safety units. The police department's mobile command post pictured at the bottom is an unarmored, unarmed vehicle equivalent to a civilian commercial recreational vehicle. The department has had this piece of equipment since 2001 and it is equipped with radio communications and audio visual equipment to assist in command and control of special events, critical and non-critical incidents, disaster scenes, and has actually been uh, the centerpiece at a number of community engagement efforts by our city and by our department. The MCP can also serve as a backup dispatch operation in the event of a catastrophic failure at the police department's headquarters building. The vehicle also allows for mobile incident command and use of the incident command systems, facilitating the best possible near scene decision making. The MCP also provides mobility, sheltering and logistical support, restroom facilities, a conference room and electrical power. The MCP provides mobility and support at one location in a quick deploying package. Now the photo in the upper left shows our SWAT van which was acquired in the year 2001. It is used to carry tactical equipment. It serves as a forward tactical command post. And like its larger MCP counterpart, it also possesses radio communications equipment. Though it carries tactical gear from one location to a, another, it is also unarmored and has no weapons affixed to it. In the upper right, you see a smaller command vehicle. The police department possesses four smaller command vehicles. These are essentially sport utility vehicles built on an Explorer chassis that serve as forward command posts when needed. These vehicles allow for mobile incident command and use of the incident command systems as well. They facilitate the best possible near scene decision making. The rear portion of the vehicle's passenger compartment has an additional radio and mobile data computer 
as well as dry erase boards that are useful in coordinating responses to larger incidents. Three of these vehicles are currently marked as black and white patrol units, which we assign to our patrol sergeants who serve in a supervisory role. The fourth command vehicle, which you see here, is assigned to the Special Operations Division Commander. Section six deals with weaponized aircraft, vessels, or vehicles of any kind. And I can just say that Oxnard PD does not have equipment from this category. Next category, battering rams, slugs, and breaching apparatuses that are explosive in nature. However, items designed to remove a lock, such as bolt cutters or a handheld ram designed to be operated by one person are specifically excluded from the subdivision. Battering rams and breaching apparatus are used to defeat locked and barricade or fortified locations, allowing officers to conduct rescues or high-risk forcible entries. This includes, but is not limited to rescuing hostages. These items allow officers to quickly enter a structure when time is of the essence. And this would also include, but is not limited to, situations such as involving a kidnapping or an active shooter situation. In such cases, time is of the essence and it would not be feasible to wait for other delayed access to the structure. Now, there are alternatives which are used for lower risk and or non-fortified situations. This includes handheld battering rams, which are not deemed as military equipment by AB 481. However, this alternative does not afford the same level of protection or speed that such equipment provides when necessary. As such, there are no reasonable alternatives that can achieve the same objectives of officer and civilian safety. And of note, um, the only equipment that we have under this category are these breaching shotguns. And as you can see them, they're pictured here. Um, they are exclusively used by our SWAT team and they have to undergo special annual training and recertification in order to continue using them. These shotguns fire a shell similar to the one that you see on the right which has a frangible uh, projectile. And when I say frangible, it's a brittle or fragile projectile, uh, such as copper or clay. And it is used against either the bolt uh, mechanism of a door or the hinge mechanisms of a door in order to quickly defeat that. Um, they use frangible materials to avoid uh, the uh, spray of, of any debris from the round and minimize the risk to the officers or, or the public. So that's an overview of that type of equipment. On slide 16, we see category eight, which includes firearms of 50 caliber or greater. However, standard issue shotguns are specifically excluded from this subdivision. So we do have uh, shotguns in our uh, inventory at the police department, but we do not have any type of firearms that are 50 caliber or greater in size. In terms of ammunition, the same case applies. Ammunition of 50 caliber or greater. However, shotgun ammunition is also excluded from this subdivision. So we do have shotgun ammunition, but we do not have any ammunition of 50 caliber or greater. Specialized firearms and ammunition of less than 50 caliber, including assault weapons as defined in sections 30510 and 30515 of the California Penal Code, with the exception of standard issue service weapons and ammunition of less than 50 caliber that are issued to officers, agents, or employees of a law enforcement agency or a state agency. So patrol rifles, special weapons and tactics, SWAT rifles and sniper rifles enable officers to address medium to long distance threats or those threats who are heavily armed, armored, or both. A good example of this would be in the uh, North Hollywood bank robbery in the late 90s where the suspects had robbed a bank and they were carrying uh, automatic weapons, assault weapons. They were wearing heavy body armor and had uh, lots of lots of ammunition in, in drums type magazines. Further, in both short and long distance deployments, these types of rifles and weapons allow officers precision shot placement to, and minimizes the risk of to officers and innocent citizens. So in today's world, it has become increasingly common for criminals to possess assault weapons, such as in the example I just mentioned, and law enforcement needs to this type of equipment just to maintain parity. 
You can see a couple pictures here, uh, which are 5.56 millimeter patrol rifles. They're they're typical of what we issue to our rifle uh, to some of our officers. Um, they have to undergo a special training course and have to undergo annual certification with those uh, with that same equipment. We currently deploy these rifles on a daily basis. And when I say deploy, this refers to the equipment being carried by the officers into the field in a variety of ways, such as merely carrying it secured in a police car. This rifle platform, however, is not considered to be standard issue equipment by our department. Selected officers must complete this course that I mentioned and maintain their proficiency. Selected officers may be in a variety of assignments, ranging from patrol officers to those on our SWAT team and other specialized assignments. The rifles that we issue, they are um, categorized as an assault weapon in, under the penal code and have characteristics um, of an assault weapon as prescribed by the California, the California Penal Code sections that I just mentioned a, a minute ago. We do also possess um, six uh, 308 caliber bolt action sniper rifles. These are also of limited issue, provided only to SWAT officers who also have to undergo specialized training and qualification. All of these rifles may be deployed in circumstances where the officer can articulate a reasonable expectation that the rifle may be needed. Examples of some general guidelines for deploying these types of rifles include, but are not limited to, situations where the officer reasonably anticipates an armed encounter, when an officer is faced with a situation that may require accurate and effective fire at long range, situations where an officer reasonably expects the need to meet or exceed a suspect's firepower, when a, an officer reasonably believes there, there may be a need to fire on a barricaded person or a person with a hostage, or when an officer reasonably believes that a suspect may be wearing body armor. There are no known alter alternatives to these weapons that will provide the same level of distance or precision. As such, there are no reasonable alternatives that can achieve the same objectives of officer and civilian safety. The next slide, we have any firearm or firearm accessory that is designed to launch explosive projectiles. We do not possess equipment under this category. Category 12 concerns flashbang grenades, and explosive breaching tools, tear gas, and pepper balls. And that excludes standard service issued handheld pepper spray. And the first thing I'll have to say here is that uh, the police department does not use any type of chemical explosives. We do not have a, an explosives detail and we do not deploy explosives to breach doors or other entry points. So let's talk about flashbangs. These are used as a distraction device in order to disorient or divert a suspect's attention away from officers. It is typically a flash of light followed by a high decibel rated sound wave, and this actually allows officers to gain safer access to a high risk situation as it gives them extra time to assess and analyze the existing threats. When these devices are deployed, typically the uh, person who is on the receiving end of this is uh, momentarily distracted or if not disoriented, which then gives the officers some degree of initiative that they're able to to uh, take further action. As such, this uh, can prevent injury to both officers and members of the public. These devices can lend towards a safer resolution and allow officers to take a suspect into custody without further use of force. There is no known alternative to a flashbang when one is necessary. So moving along to tear gas in this particular slide, tear gas and actually pepper ball. Tear gas, which is also known as CS gas, as you can see on the, um, the canisters in the photo here, are used, they are actually, they are less lethal rounds that they are used to address a violent or riotous crowd when there is a risk of physical safety. They are also used to safely extract a suspect from a fixed location or safely detain a suspect who poses a risk of violence to officers. Tear gas allows peace officers to, to use a less lethal chemical agent 
into a structure where other weapons would not be capable of doing so. And these less lethal options afford peace officers an added option to avoid deadly force encounters. And another point of order that I think is important to convey here is that the Oxnard Police Department has not deployed tear gas to address crowds in many decades. The use of this has been limited to SWAT deployments involving barricaded suspects. And on this slide, you can see uh, up on the upper left is a 40 millimeter launcher. And you can see the, very, the projectile that can project the uh, tear gas. Um, the other items on the right and the top, the four canisters, those are handheld um, um, grenades that can be deployed in a variety of different ways. Um, the photos that you see at the bottom of this slide are not from Oxnard Police Department, but I just wanted to include them to show how they are used in, in a variety of situations. In this particular slide, we see the pepper ball uh, launcher, which is essentially, it's a paintball gun. It is CO2 powered. It's carbon compressed carbon dioxide propels a frangible, that is a fragile um, projectile. In this case, it is, they are ball shaped munitions that contain a powder known as PAVA, which when it comes into contact with a hard surface, the ball breaks and the powder disperses. As you can see in the uh, demonstration photo on the, uh, the right. And this is also particularly useful in uh, having suspects exit enclosed spaces such as vehicles or places such as an attic or a closet or something like that. Um, again, this is another less lethal device that is uh, a tool for officers to uh, mitigate the possibility of having to use a greater level of force. Category 13 has to deal with the taser shockwave, microwave weapons, water cannons, and the long range acoustic, acoustic devices known as LRADs. And I can suffice to say that Oxnard PD does not have any equipment from this category. In category 14, we have the following projectile launch platforms and their associated munitions, 40 millimeter projectile launchers, bean bag, rubber bullet, and specialty impact munition weapon. Like I showed you in the earlier slide, you see at the lower left, the 40 millimeter launcher that can project this type of uh, shells, whether it's tear gas or it's an impact munition. The one above that is actually has a rotary magazine and can fire, I believe it's six uh, 40 millimeter uh, uh, rounds before having to reload. The item in the middle that you see is actually an item that we would have in our inventory. It's a 40 millimeter uh, shell and the blue tip is actually made out of foam. So it's a foam projectile that is used as a less lethal um, tool. The more common type of less lethal tool that we have, though, is found as, as the uh, beanbag in the beanbag shotgun. These are shotguns that have been repurposed and they have been marked with a clearly marked um, less lethal uh, label. They're usually given a different color, in this case, orange, and they fire a less lethal 12 gauge beanbag projectile up to a distance of approximately 75 feet. This allows officers to confront front a potentially armed or dangerous suspect at a longer distance and serves as another force option intended to not kill the target. Beanbag shotguns prevent deadly force encounters. They've been successfully deployed by the Oxnard Police Department for over 20 years with many instances that prevented would have otherwise resulted in a lethal use of force. So when necessary, there is no alternative to these less lethal weapon systems. And essentially this beanbag shotgun is firing a small bag with, with, uh, uh, with, a, with bean bags, with beans in it that actually, not real beans, but beans that um, are intended to not injure or not kill the, uh, the person. Article, or item number 15, is kind of a catch-all provision and that this refers to any other equipment 
as determined by a governing body or a state agency to require additional oversight. In other words, the governing body can elect to add additional equipment types to what is deemed by that organization to be military equipment. So moving forward to a recap, um, we will, the equipment uh, listed in the Oxnard Police Department's policy reflects the items that I spoke to uh, in this presentation. They are critical to the efficiency and to the public safety, and there are no other practical alternatives for them. The policy and the ordinance safeguards the public's welfare, safety, civil rights, and civil liberties. The policy ensures that there are safeguards, including transparency, oversight, and accountability measures in place. For example, the policy requires that the police department will ensure that its personnel comply with it. The police department will conduct an annual inventory and review of its military equipment. Deviations from the policy will be corrected if or when discovered, and members of the public are provided direction how to register complaints for violations. Any military equipment items which result in a use of force will be thoroughly investigated as is already required and performed by existing and what I will say are robust police department policies and practices that involve thorough multi-layered review of any such use of force. If policy 708 is approved by the council ordinance, we will submit to the city council and post to its website the annual report, which is in compliance with government code section 7072. And we will also hold a community engagement meeting prior to bringing that report before the council. Based on the annual report, the city council will determine compliance with the standards for approval for each type of equipment identified in the report and determine whether to renew, modify, approve, or disapprove the renewal of authorization for each type of identified military equipment. And just in closing, I do wanna add that, I uh, do wanna say again that the policy is available on oxnardpd.org. If you go to the um, top navigation menu under transparency, you will see a section for AB 481. Our entire policy has also uh, been online. It's been online for some time. We, if you ever have any questions about the policy, I encourage you to uh, uh, take a, a look at it there. It may be able to answer your questions. At this point, this concludes my report for uh, this time being. And I plan, the plan is to take this item to a public hearing before the entire city council on April 19th, in which we will introduce the policy to the entire council and um, along with the first reading for the ordinance that we propose for adoption uh, with the adoption um, hearing to be scheduled at this point for June 7th of this year. So this concludes my presentation and I will be available for any questions. Thank you.